Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor Jim Pytel and today's topic of discussion is pneumatic systems. Our objective is to introduce pneumatic systems. We'll discuss their characteristics as well as examine the similarities and important differences between pneumatic and hydraulic systems. Warning, the pneumatics playlist is not intended to be a standalone playlist, but rather a bonus round extension of the hydraulics playlist available at the Big Bad Tech channel. If you haven't completed this aforementioned lecture series yet, only dimly recall its contents, please take the time to do so now. The pneumatics playlist presumes the viewer can perform circular area and cylindrical volume calculations, can use Pascal's law, is able to interpret fluid power schematics with ease, understands pressure and flow control, and has an intimate understanding of how fundamental fluid power properties like valve position, pressure, and flow rate dictate system performance. I categorically refuse to rehash these same subjects since they equally apply to pneumatic systems. This being said, it's perhaps worth a quick review to ensure your existing tool set is in working order. First, a directional control valve is used to stop, start, and change direction of fluid flow in a fluid power system. When this valve is placed in the cross-connect position, pressurized flow is routed to the rod end and the cap end is exhausted at low pressure. The double acting cylinder retracts. Conversely, when placed in the straight through position, pressurized fluid is routed to the cap end and the rod end is exhausted at low pressure. The double acting cylinder extends. In summary, valve position determines actuator direction. This is true for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Next, Pascal's law states that force is equal to pressure times area. Increased pressure on a large surface area results in more force. Conversely, decreased pressure on a smaller surface area results in less force. As a quick test of your requisite knowledge, consider a double acting cylinder with a cap diameter of three and a half inches and a rod diameter of an inch and a half. Let's say the maximum pressure this system is capable of exerting is six bar. See if you can determine the maximum extension force and the maximum retraction force of this cylinder. By all means, pause the lecture and try this on your own. If you're tracking, you should have obtained the following results. Extension necessitates pressurized fluid enter the cap end port and the rod end port be exhausted at low pressure. During extension, pressurized fluid acts on the full cap end area. The circular cap end is equal to pi over 4 times the diameter of the cap squared. Substituting our values results in a cap area of roughly 9.6 square inches. Retraction necessitates pressurized fluid enter the rod end port and the cap end port be exhausted at low pressure. During retraction, pressurized fluid acts on the ring-like annular surface area of the rod end. The area of the rod is equal to pi over 4 times the diameter of the rod squared. Substituting in our given values results in a rod area of roughly 1.8 square inches. The ring-like rod end area is equal to the area of the cap minus the area of the rod. Substituting in our calculated values results in a rod end area of roughly 7.9 square inches. One bar is equal to roughly 14.5 psi. A unit conversion demonstrates our maximum pressure of 6 bar is equal to roughly 87 psi. Extension uses the full circular cap end area. An application of Pascal's law demonstrates that 87 psi acting on the surface area of 9.6 square inches results in a maximum extension force of roughly 837 pounds. Retraction uses the smaller ring-like rod end area. An application of Pascal's law demonstrates 87 psi acting on a surface area of 7.9 square inches results in a maximum retraction force of roughly 683.3 pounds force. You will note that given the same pressure, extension force is greater than retraction. Why? Because during extension, pressure acts on the full circular cap end area, whereas during retraction, pressure acts on the smaller ring-like rod end area. This is always true. In summary, pressure determines the force of a fluid power system. This is true for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. By the way, if you didn't get these answers, go away. You are not presently up to the task. Like I mentioned earlier, the pneumatics playlist necessitates the user have the prerequisite knowledge of the preceding hydraulics playlist. Feel free to return to this lecture when you are so qualified. Lastly, actuator speed is dependent upon flow rate. Flow rate Q is a measure of volume per unit time. To calculate extension time, one would divide the full cylindrical volume of the cap end by the incoming flow rate. Similarly, to calculate retraction time, one would divide the smaller tubular volume of the rod end by the incoming flow rate. Any increase in flow rate or decrease in volume results in shorter extension and retraction times. Conversely, any decrease in flow rate or increase in volume 
results in longer extension or retraction times. In summary, flow rate determines the speed of a fluid power system. This is true for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Ultimately, valve position determines actuator direction, pressure determines actuator force, and flow rate determines actuator speed. If you emerge from the hydraulics playlist with just this simple understanding intact, I will consider my efforts having not been spent in vain. To suggest that these are independent and isolated phenomenon is an obvious oversimplification. As we learned in the aforementioned lecture series, there is an interplay between pressure and flow rate and vice versa, such that flow control methods like meter in, meter out, and bypass, and pressure control valves like sequence valves, pressure reducing valves, unloading valves, and counterbalance valves influence fluid system performance. So direction, force, and speed can be varied as the user sees fit. What's nice about pneumatics is all these same relationships hold true, albeit with some subtle and not so subtle performance differences. Allow me to demonstrate. As you are no doubt aware, a fluid is something that does not have a definite shape and conforms to the shape of its container. Both liquids and gases are fluids. A liquid is a fluid that has a definite volume, but no definite shape. For our intents and purposes, liquids are to be considered essentially incompressible, meaning that a certain quantity of liquid always has the same volume at any and all pressure conditions. By the way, this is another obvious oversimplification, but good enough for our use. Hydraulic systems use pressurized liquids, typically oil, to perform tasks easier or quicker than can an unaided human. Pneumatic systems, in contrast, use pressurized gases, typically environmental air conditioned for use. A gas is also a fluid, only it has neither a definite volume nor a definite shape and fills the shape and volume of its container. Gases are compressible, meaning that a given quantity of gas molecules could be compressed into a smaller volume or expanded to a larger volume. The simple difference between incompressible liquids and compressible gases has a dramatic consequence regarding the performance of similarly configured hydraulic and pneumatic systems. Consider a double acting hydraulic cylinder. When spring offset into the cross connect position, pressurized incompressible oil is routed to the rod end and the cap end is routed to tank at low pressure. The cylinder retracts. When manually positioned to the straight through position, Pressurized incompressible oil is routed to the cap end, and the rod end is routed to tank at low pressure. The cylinder extends. No surprises here. Similarly, consider an almost identically configured double acting pneumatic cylinder. When spring offset into the deactivated state, pressurized compressible air is routed to the rod end. Incoming pressurized air is schematically illustrated as an inward pointing clear triangle. The cap end, however, is not routed to tank but rather exhausted to the environment. An exhaust port is identified using an outward pointing clear triangle. The cylinder retracts. When the valve is manually moved into the activated position, pressurized compressible air is routed to the cap end, and this time the rod end is exhausted to the surrounding environment. The cylinder extends. Again, no surprises here. Long story short, valve position controls actuator direction for both hydraulic and pneumatic systems. The fundamental difference being that in pneumatic systems, exhausted air is not routed back to a tank as it is in a hydraulic system, but rather expelled into the environment. After all, air is clean and free, at least for the time being, and you can always get some more. This is one of the major advantages of pneumatic systems. The fluid used in pneumatic systems, air, is cheap, clean, and plentiful, given we're quite literally immersed in it at all times. Oil, in contrast, is dirty, heavy, expensive, and must be contained in a reservoir for continual reuse. This exhausted air expelled into the environment in pneumatic systems often results in a characteristic hiss every time a valve is shifted from one position to the next. You note this particular valve has two exhaust ports, and these exhaust ports are located at the bottom of the valve body at the point of use. Sometimes you'll see a muffler or a silencer intended to minimize this hissing sound. The muffler schematic symbol is kind of this maze-like zigzag passage for escaping air. Mufflers or silencers are designed such that the exhausted air doesn't experience any undue back pressure. Visually, a muffler or a silencer looks like a little thimble or a filter screwed into a port or sometimes a perforated screen. We'll examine pneumatic directional control valves and other components unique to pneumatic systems in greater detail in later lectures. While I've got this example in front of us, let's discuss how pressure and flow rate influence actuator force and speed for these two different systems. Presuming our earlier figures remain valid, i.e. a cylinder with a cap diameter of 3.5 inches and a rod diameter of 1.5 inches and a system capable of producing at maximum a pressure of 87 psi, 
Pascal's law would demonstrate that both systems will extend with 837 pounds force and retract with 683.3 pounds force. Presuming a constant flow rate at these conditions, extension will be slower and retraction will be faster because extension necessitates a larger cap end volume be filled and retraction uses a smaller tubular rond end volume. Again, no surprises here. In summary, valve position controls actuator direction, pressure controls actuator force, and flow rate determines actuator speed. Like I said, these fundamental properties remain equally valid for both systems. This being said, important differences do exist, largely due to oil's incompressibility and air's compressibility.